This is episode 80 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. Hey, you guys, welcome back. Once again, this is the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Austin, Texas. I am so excited to bring you guys this interview. I could not be more honored to have such a great gentleman on the show. One of my political heroes is here with us, the great Lou Rockwell, founder and chairman of the Mises Institute. Of course, most of y'all know who he is. You know he's a great author as well. And one of the things we'll talk about today is his new book, Against the Left, a Rothbardian Libertarianism, where in this excellent little book, Lou smashes apart the so-called philosophy that is leftism, and including the leftism that's trying to seep its way in to the liberty movement over the past few decades. Get this book, and you will see Lou smash that apart as he does so eloquently. Another thing you'll see in this book, if you open in the first page or two, your host and humble narrator here was a contributor to the book financially, and it says thanks to the Death to Tyrants podcast in the list of thank you. So what an honor it was to have that in there and to be able to help Lou put this book out and get it published. Real quick, he's got several other books, and one I really want to hit upon is The Left, The Right, and The State. That's one of these books that people say, hey, Buck, uh, what book would you recommend I read on libertarianism? Whether they're new to the movement or not, I generally tell them, The Left, the Right, and the State by Lou Rockwell. It covers so much great stuff in there. So we'll link to that in the show notes page, as well as the new book, of course. Lou Rockwell is an American author, editor, and political consultant, a libertarian and self-professed anarcho-capitalist. He founded and is chairman of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting the Austrian School of Economics. He also started a website, Lou Rockwell. Dot com where, as a side note here, I read every morning. It's uh, excellent stuff on there. It features articles and blog entries by a number of libertarian columnists and writers. Here in this libertarian world, many of us stand on the shoulders of giants. For you guys today, I've got one of those giants here. The great Lou Rockwell is on death to tyrants. Lou, welcome to the show and thank you for being here. Buck, it's great to be with you and, and you know, now that we're on the air, I want to thank you so much for your help with my book, Against the Left. It was uh, an honor to have your help, and it's great to have the name of your podcast as one of the uh, one of the supporters of the book. Well, that, that's exactly how I feel. The first thing I did was run to my mailbox when I knew it was there and open it up in the truck and look, there it is, my podcast name in a yeah. Lou Rockwell book. Amazing. So... I sincerely believe this. I've said it many times. Uh, My listeners are probably tired of hearing it, but the Mises Institute to me is the greatest organization on the planet. And I'd like to ask you about its origins. How did it come to be? What part did you play in its inception? And what part did Murray Rothbard play? Let's see. When when I was a very young guy, when I was uh, 24, I was called into uh, the office of the head of Arlington House Publishers, uh, Neil McCaffrey, who asked me, how'd you like to be Ludwig von Mises' editor? Well, that was that was uh, maybe overstating the case, but it was to help bring back uh, three of his books into print and also uh, a, um, a monograph of his for the first time into print. So, of course, I was thrilled, and I, I was uh, m- more than thrilled to get to uh, deal with Ludwig von Mises uh, on the telephone and once uh, over dinner and uh, with his wife, Margaret von Mises, um, much more and uh, got to know her quite well. So that later on, some years later, when I was concerned that Austrian economics seemed to be uh, losing its supporters, and when I was especially concerned that Mises, who I thought was such a great man, such a great hero, uh, didn't seem to be uh, didn't seem to be as well known. So this time I was working for a, a think tank at Emory University, a place that was not exactly the Mises Institute, but it was 
pretty good for a, for a neoclassical place. And I was the associate director. And I, I thought, you know, I, I, I thought to myself one day, I can do this. And so I, I uh, put in for nonprofit status with the IRS. Terrible that we have to do that. And uh, once that, once I got that, I, I resigned, gave my resignation to that institute and started my own. And at the time, it was just really a, a typewriter on the kitchen table kind of a situation. But I was able to, for the, I should say, the first person I asked for permission before I actually resigned and started the institute uh, was Margaret von Mises. Her favorite restaurant was the Russian Tea Room in New York City. So I invited her to have lunch with me. And uh, she was just a great lady. Murray Rothbard referred to her uh, in, in her, his obituary as a one-woman Mises industry. <laughs> and she really, she really was that. And I remember she was a very uh, strict lady. And she said to me, I know you just want the use of my name. You don't actually want me involved in this. And I, I said, that's not actually true. By the way, I thought it would be impossible to bring that about even if I wanted it. Uh, but mm -hmm. I didn't want it. I wanted her active participation and... She was a great active participant, a tremendous person. And really, till the end of her life, she worked hard on getting Mises' books translated into other languages, published in other countries. Um, she was just, she was a great inspiration. And the second person I talked to was Murray Rothbard. And I remember we were walking down the sidewalk, and I told him uh, what I wanted to do. And, and he actually leapt in the air and clapped his hands. I've never seen anybody, anybody do that. <laughs> And he was he was extremely happy, and of course was uh, essential to the. Uh, his title was academic vice president, but really he was the the great man behind everything, in terms of his inspiration, his unbelievable intellect, uh, the word, the books that he had written, the things that he wrote for us, just just tremendous. So uh, then I asked other people if they would come on board, and and really everybody for the most part, was very interested and, and very excited about the idea that there would be such a thing. Should I tell the story about what happened with the Koch brothers? That would be interesting. Yes, that's a good one. So I had um, a good friend who was, at that time, the, the head of the Koch Foundation. Uh, and I, I wrote him and I, I said, uh, you know, I want to start this and it would be great to have the support of the, of the foundation. So he called me up just furious, I mean, shouting at me, he said, how dare you do this? Don't you realize the amount of time and money we've spent making sure that people paid no attention to Mises and only paid attention to Hayek, who's, you know, that uh, everybody likes Hayek, nobody likes Mises. He said, even Milton Friedman doesn't like Mises. And I said, well, to the extent that's true, that's a medal on Mises' chest. <laughs> but I, I uh, of course, I, <laughs> he pretty much hung up on me, and that was the end of my relationship with the Koch brothers. But there were people who didn't agree. Who didn't didn't agree with that? There were people who had known Mises, uh, people who were uh, uh, great, like Henry Hazlitt, who was not only a great, you know, a great economist, uh, a great man, and a great benefactor to the institute uh, upon his death. Uh, but he was a he was a strong supporter. We had many people like this who who had, they had actually known Mises. This was if it if this if I'd done this. Uh, 10 or 20 years later, it I might not have been as successful because people wouldn't have known Mises, but we had uh, great men and women who had known Mises, loved Mises, knew what kind of a man he was, and were, were anxious to have a Mises Institute. And so that, um, that, was, that was back in 1982, 1983. And uh, I think, you know, we've done okay since then. It's, we're still a, a small organization, but we're uh, financially successful organization. Uh, we're not, you know, the equivalent of the Cato Institute or the Heritage Foundation, but we really, we do okay. And we, in those, since those days, we've had all kinds of programs, student programs, uh, uh, faculty programs uh, that have brought really thousands of young people and also faculty through the, through the Institute and many, many more than that <coughs> who've uh, benefited from the Institute through our, our website. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, we've done pretty well. The, the Koch brothers never forgave us, but you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's too bad, but that's just the way it was. And I did have somebody tell me that, that, well, I actually had a, uh, I won't name him, but, a 
a uh, well-known economist who said to me, Lou, this, is, this organization is going nowhere unless you have an angel. He said, you have to have an angel. You have to have somebody who really puts big money in at the beginning. Otherwise, you're dead. And uh, I had another person who had heard, or heard this and said, no, Lou, you're so much better off with smaller donors uh, because if you have a, 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 an angel and he turns into the devil, then you're dead. Right. So, so uh, um, we were lucky to have and are lucky to have many, many smaller donors. We've had some significant donors, too, especially people who uh, left us money in their, in their wills. And we're very grateful, obviously, for any kind of donation that people give us. Uh, but we're, we're, we're thrilled by everybody associated with the Institute, whether it's, as, whether it's our board, whether it's our faculty, whether it's the, our students. Uh, we, we just, uh, whether they're people like you who are donors and, and supporters and who, uh, you know, you're the kind of person who makes this whole thing run. So thank you and thanks to uh, you, your uh, listeners who also support us. And I, of course, I'm, I'm prejudiced, but I think the Mises Institute is, is a pretty great organization. And I think that it's done well, and I think it will continue to do well. We have, you just uh, did a podcast with Jeff Dice, who's our new president, or actually not yes. new. I mean, it's been, I guess, five years, but, uh-huh. uh, who's doing a great job. And uh, we just have a, a tremendous staff. And really, I'm just, I couldn't be more pleased at the progress the Institute is making uh, and certainly we're needed. I mean, if we think about what we're facing these days, whether it's, you know, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez or all the other communists who are promoting their ideas, and the, there don't seem to be many unvarnished capitalists around. So I think this, this is an important role for the Institute, and uh, we, we want to keep doing it. We want people to help us keep doing it, and uh, people should be on our mailing list doesn't cost you anything to be on our list. If you want to be a member of the Institute, it's $60 a year. So we're thrilled by people who do that too. And um, I'd, I'd urge everybody to please look at Mises.org. Spend some time on the website. It's an extraordinary website. I mean, the amount of material on the website is really, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's difficult to believe, but it's got a huge number of, of Austrian books and um, YouTubes and it's just and lots of articles thousands of articles. Uh, and really, I remember a guy who had gotten sick and had to spend a year at home while his wife worked. And he he said he was just pretty much doing the housework. So what he did was he decided he was going to listen to everything on Mises.org. <laughs> and he did so. And uh, he said it taught him Austrian economics. And he didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I'm not suggesting that that's for everybody. But um, there's an unbelievable amount of material on the on the website of every sort. Also, you can, uh, you know, there's uh, Mises Wire is new every day. So we just urge everybody to jump in, join. There's uh, so much to learn, so much to do. And it's, uh, um, maybe it's more essential now than at any time since the 1930s, when the left seemed to be uh, just uh, going to uh, uh, stronger and stronger victories. So, in those days, it was the communists, it was the National Socialists, and uh, the, the so-called Democratic Socialists, and, and and all the rest. And we have a lot of those people today. Yeah, they may have some of the different names, but uh, they need to be they need to be battled. So uh, you know that's our job, and we welcome everybody's help in trying to do it. And we welcome too if people have good suggestions suggestions for us about things that we ought to be doing that we're not doing, uh, things that we you know can do better. We're, we're obviously very glad to have those kinds of uh, that kind of help as well. I want to ask you about coalitions because you've written about that over the years. You wrote a great manifesto years ago that I love, I believe in 1990, called The Case for Paleo Libertarianism. And it called for a coalition between libertarianism and paleo conservatives, which I've always been sympathetic to. I've had Paul Gottfried on here a few times. Are there natural coalitions today, Lou, that you believe libertarians should be pursuing? Yes, I, I think so. And by the way, um, Paul's got a new book coming out. You maybe want to interview him about it. Yes, sir. Um, so that's, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great man. So I think that the, there are coalitions. I think Hans Hermann Hoppe makes this point especially well, that there are certain cultural values that are more consistent with libertarianism than others. 
Doesn't mean that uh, people can't be left-wing libertarians, uh, although maybe I would dif differ with that, but certainly the people who claim to be. But I think that, um, and this is, you know, something my, this is about what my book is about, that um, there are the paleoconservatives, conservatives, uh, we, we, you know, we welcome them. And I think it's a, a natural coalition. People on the right are, are much more uh, um, open to our kinds of libertarianism than people on the left. So I think people on the left are, you know, by and large, the enemy, not, not that everybody on the left is an enemy, but, but uh, by and large, they are. And there are bad people on the right, of course, but there are lots of good people on the right. And in my own experience, and maybe this is partly because I sort of, I've co I come out of the right. Uh, as a boy, I was a uh, conservative, a paleoconservative, later became a paleo-libertarian. So I think, I think that's, you know, People can take a look at my book, Against the Left, uh, which makes the case, I think, for certain kinds of uh, coalitions. And absolutely, coalitions can be very important. And I think that uh, Murray Rothbard certainly had that view, and, and uh, I have that view as well. Let's talk about Against the Left, your new book uh, that we mentioned already a few times. I can't recommend this enough for my listeners out there. It's an easy, wonderful read and... Uh, it's cheap. I was shocked at that as well when I saw that down there in uh, Lake Jackson. Talk about what motivated you to write this book and the threat that leftism poses not only to society in general, but even to the libertarian movement to an extent. Well, I say the most important thing about this book is it's got a tremendous preface by Hans Hermann Hoppe. Just it's, it's uh, typical of Hans. It's, it's a tremendous piece of work. So he that's that's I would think the first it's the first thing in the book and the first thing uh, one should read. But I I talk about you know the left the fact that the left hates the family. I was wa I was watching um, Tucker Carlson the other night, and and uh, he had this guest on who who said um, he was talking about Marx, and he said you know at least Marx never blamed people for living in, in, in rural lives. He, he, this guy was in a, this guy's like some kind of neocon, I guess, in effect praising Marx. But of course, Marx talked about the idiocy of rural life. He hated people who lived mm -hmm. in rural areas. So I think that uh, if one thing we can look to is all the people who are targeted by the left, all the people who are hated by the left. So that's religious people, that's people who live in in rural areas, people who live in in uh, in areas that are maybe poorer. So that um, it's funny that we all, we always are taught that that the uh, the left is uh, a bunch of poor people and the right is a bunch of rich people. Well, as we know, you know there are rich, obviously rich white people and and uh, poor left people, but it's typically the other way around. The, the wealthy people are the leftists, and the and the poorer people are the rightists. So this, you know, we have to be open, of course, to anybody who agrees with us. And they don't have to agree with us 100%. Nobody, that, that was always said to Murray Rothbard by his enemies, that uh, he, his view was you had to agree with them 100%. Well, of course, not only is that nonsense, it, uh, Murray was allied over his lifetime with many different groups who had differences with him, but basically agreed. So that, um, uh, you know, that's, it's essential that we be open to coalitions. So... But one thing the left wants to do, they want to destroy the traditional family. This is, this is true of, uh, of Marx. It's true of everybody since Marx. Really, it was true of Plato. I mean, this is the left. It goes way back in history to Plato and, and the Platonists who uh, hated, hated the traditional family and wanted the children to be raised by other people than their parents. Uh, so that's, I think, a horrendous idea, and I, th I think there's no question that uh, you know the the, ha the hatred of the left uh, against the family is just really most the most open uh, that I've ever seen it. It's quite something. I think that um, you know we also have what the 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 fact that they want everybody to be equal. Uh, I was like Mises' point that that, uh, that the, the 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 key aspect of of human nature is our radical inequality. It's not our equality. And he said, if we actually were all equal, we wouldn't be able to have a civilization. We wouldn't be able to have an economy because everybody would have to be the same. And um, it's, of course, Murray Rothbard, who wrote a great book on, on uh, egalitarianism as a revolt against nature. 
um, also had this view that, that of course, the key thing is our, our inequality. And isn't it wonderful that we're unequal, that we're different, uh, that we're, if, I, if you'll excuse the word, diverse. It's a good thing we're diverse. So that it's, it's um, but the people who are uh, the leftists hate inequality. They love equality. And, of course, they actually typically don't really believe in equality, but certainly not for themselves. But they, um, uh, they want equality for everybody else, and they want us to all bow down. And, and uh, have, this, of course, goes back to the, oh, gosh, the, certainly the French Revolution. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. There are several interesting stories that were told about, well, this one Greek tyrant. He was the tyrant of a city, and uh, the tyrant of the, of the city next door sent an, an aide to him to find out how was he keeping in power? How, how could he stay in power for such a long time and seemingly without any trouble? So the, the tyrant took the young man out into his garden and he took out his sword and he, uh, there were poppies growing in the garden and he cut off all the tall poppies, cut off the heads of all the tall poppies. He didn't say a word and the other, the, the other tyrant you know, got the point. So the, this is, uh, there was also the story of Procrustes who had a, a, an iron bed and so if you were stopping, he would invite you to stay at his home overnight, and he would then have you taken into the bed. If your legs were longer than the bed, he'd cut off the end of your legs. If your legs were too short uh, as compared to the length of the bed, then he would put you, and he would put you on a rack and stretch you out. Uh, so these were both stories about egalitarianism, about people who believe in, in, in the evil of equality. So I think if you're a libertarian... Uh, you have to oppose equality, and um, the left libertarians, so-called, don't oppose equality. They're, they're, they tend to be egalitarians, not all of them, uh, but many of them. So I think that um, I go into this a little bit in the book, mm -hmm. but um, and I you know, talk about other things as well. But I would say the family, um, and also I talk about environmentalism, which is, uh, seems to be even crazier today than it's ever been where you actually have people who who actually want to get rid of so-called fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I, I should say I don't I, I think that's an incorrect uh, an incorrect name. I don't think I don't think the so-called fossil fuels actually are the result of uh, dinosaurs or fir, uh, ancient fern plants or whatever that that uh, dissolved in the earth and and we came up with oil and gas. I think that um, I think the the Russian scientists are right that the earth itself generates uh, oil and gas, and this is why there, we keep discovering massive new amounts of it. Uh, thank goodness, of course, that we're not dependent on on, uh, on, on dinosaurs. What's that gasoline company that has as a, as a dinosaur as its symbol? Yeah, so yes. That, it's, it's, I mean, it's cute, but, that's, <laughs> but it's not true. So thank goodness, but again, again we have people who actually want to outlaw Oil and gas. I mean, they which would not be good for Texas. It wouldn't be good for civilization, for that matter. Uh, so that it's a uh, it's it, these these environmentalists are maniacal. Uh, whether we look at um, you know Greta Thunberg or or <laughs> uh, Casio Cortez or any of these people, they want destruction of human prosperity. And uh, there are people maybe in the elites who want to go right along with that and think that it would be better if uh, the human population were to be smaller than it is. Uh, so I, I would say thank goodness for the size of the population, thank goodness for oil and gas, and uh, uh, the heck with the people who want to get rid of these, these fantastic symbols and actualities of, of uh, prosperity. They're just, uh, I mean, I, I must say I like cars, I like uh, gasoline engines, uh, I don't like the fact that everybody's going to be forced to have an electric car. People want to have an electric car. Well, you know, uh, more power to them, I guess. But uh, they also, of course, think that that's, there's no quote-unquote pollution coming from an electric car. But, of course, they never stop to think about where the electricity has to come right. from. Right. It's generated uh, from uh, uh, oil and gas and from uh, uh, other other ways of other, other forms of generation. So it's, we have... Our work cut out for us. We have many things to be concerned about, and I think it's so important that we learn about who the enemies are and we learn to how to oppose them that we 
that we learn more and more. I mean, it's it's so important that we read, read, read. I mean, it's this book is of mine is as you say, it's short. It's not it's not a long book, although I think it's it uh, maybe a good start for for some people. Mm-hmm. But it's there's just a huge amount to read, and um, whether that's in economics, whether it's in politics, whether it's in history. Uh, it's so essential that we read and understand what the heck is happening, what these people would like to be doing to us, and just how dangerous they are. Uh, they really are they really are people who are happy to kill you if you oppose them. So um, we, have, we have, have to learn all that we can, and um, I think that's the first step to that is read. We have to read the great, uh, the great books of libertarianism. Read Murray Rothbard, read Ludwig von Mises, and um, so many others. So many great men and women have left us a, just a, tr- a tremendous legacy. And I, one thing I, uh, I remember from my days in the Libertarian Party, nobody seemed to want to read anything. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, you know that's unfortunate. I think it's it's, it's essential to read, uh, to understand, and to uh, you know be prepared. Uh, obviously, you you know you have your reading that you have to do in college, reading in high school, reading as an adult, too. But um, this libertarian reading that has to be done, and it's ab- absolutely essential. And for you guys listening that don't know any better yet, uh, the Mises Institute has a lot of this stuff for free. I've got so many free ebooks from them uh, stored on my phone, so you have no excuses. Go do it, uh, Lou. Something that you're really good on that I've not done much on this show is talk about borders and immigration. And there's always this uh, abstraction versus real world issue that comes up, especially within libertarianism. Um, Can you talk about, in a true libertarian society, I kind of call it the Hans Hoppe model, what what, uh, borders and immigration would look like? And then what's the best way to view this in the current system, it's it's a conundrum that a lot of libertarians face, and you covered it in your book quite well. Well, I think that uh, borders are essential. It requires a massive state to maintain open borders, because borders are absolutely natural. Whether we think about borders around the shopping center, or borders around a neighborhood, or around your your front lawn, uh, borders. Even though people try to demonize borders, they're actually wonderful and uh, essential to a free society. Hoppe, of course, is, as, as you point out, is, is the great writer on this. But uh, if we only look at what's happening in our own country, we see that people want to bring in massive numbers of others, people who are all going to go on welfare, are all being promised uh, free medical care, free housing, and every kind of freebie that you can think of. Uh, this, is, this is not good for the rest of us. It's not good for society as a whole. And it's, 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 it's disastrous so that we see the Democrats, and I must say I don't think President Trump is much better, even though he promised to be better. He's not much better uh, than the Democrats themselves. But we, we, we're facing a terrible situation. Uh, we have millions of people who want to come to this country, maybe tens of millions, and um, they want to live off the rest of us. This is true. It's what's happened in Europe. And, of course, we have to think, we're supposed to think that uh, if the Europeans or the Americans want to maintain their cultures and want to maintain their civilizations, why they're just evil, they're just terrible, just you know, kill them, toss them in the ocean or whatever. So it's, uh, but uh, I think Hoppe is right. I think that uh, Rothbard was right, and Murray didn't always have this view, but he did come to this view later in his life uh, that there have to be borders and that you there have to be nothing wrong with obviously some immigration. But first of all, it can't be anybody who's coming in as a bum. Uh, there has to be somebody who can support themselves. And um, I think that we're facing a, a terrible situation right now. There's a, a very interesting blog I was reading today talking about the L.A. Times, talking about, isn't it great that California will never again have a Republican uh, statewide office holder? And mm-hmm. that uh, really it's just the greatest thing ever. That, and it's, this is all because of demogra- demography. And so the person who's writing the blog said, you know, there was a time when it was uh, considered a hate crime to accuse them of this because, uh, uh, but of course, it's absolutely true. 
the people who want to have massive uh, numbers of immigrants from all over the world come here. And uh, there are those of us that think, you know, American culture has something to be said for it, just like the Europe, the European cultures have something to be said for themselves. So uh, we, there are those who'd like to destroy it, who'd like to make us all um, just just uh, people who are uh, serfs uh, serving others. And I think that's, you know, not a good thing. And again, you can, obviously some immigration is great. It's great that Mises was able to come here and great that Rothbard's ancestors were able to come here. Uh, my ancestors for that matter, uh, I think. But um, they came, all of them came to work. They all came to contribute and they weren't coming as bums. They weren't coming as, as uh, people just to live off others. So, and the, certainly they weren't coming, they were coming in a time when there was far less immigration than there is today. How many immigrants want to come to the United States? You know, the, um, uh, I saw recently that the UN estimates, and they, the UN thinks this, this is a great thing, that, uh, that there's supposed to be, there'll be tens of millions of people who want to immigrate to, the, to Europe. And I'm, I guess the, maybe the similar numbers here. People love, you know, to go on welfare. They love, there are, there are those who would come here to be workers and to be entrepreneurs, and that's all great. But uh, there are too many who uh, aren't coming with, uh, with that kind of motive in mind. So, I mean, as, as Hans points out, uh, if, if you want to bring somebody here, say, to work for your company, that's great, but you have to be responsible for their, for their costs. Mm-hmm. You can't just bring them here and put the, the cost of them on other people's backs. So I think uh, Hoppe is, our, is, is a great leader in this as in so much else, that we can't, that immigration will destroy this country and it will destroy Europe, and it's. Uh, I, I, I certainly don't think that's in the interest of the Americans or the Europeans. I don't even think it's in the interest of the world. So that I think that the Europeans and the Americans have uh, been responsible for some great inventions, for example. Uh, so that if if uh, our societies are wrecked, and there are those who d- would like our societies wrecked, I mean, they if you read them, they actually make no bones about it. Uh, I think that's not good. It's not good for the world. It's not good for us. And I think that, uh, you know, we can't go along with the whole open borders nonsense. I think, again, open borders require the state to maintain them because the borders are the perfectly natural, normal method of, of human society, whether it's a, a little community or a town, city, uh, state, whatever. So I think that um, Hop is right. And I think that uh, Rothbard was right. You know, we have to uh, we have to maintain our borders. Right now, they're being decimated. They're being destroyed. I'd like to think that that is not a, a permanent thing. But if certainly, if the uh, if the left uh, is elected this time, and as I say, I don't think I think Trump is pretty much all talk and no action on this. But uh, certainly, the left they want open borders. They want uh, open welfare. They want everybody, not every American, by the way, but every every illegal alien to have uh, free health care. And, of course, they want free everything, free, free right. uh, college tuition and, and so forth. Let me ask you before we go here, I got to get this in. Uh, can you talk really quick about your time on Capitol Hill, of all places, and working for the great Dr. Ron Paul? <laughs> well, you know, this is, and, uh, I should be ashamed to admit this, but uh, when I was a boy, I always wanted to be a congressional staffer. <laughs> I thought that it would just be a lot. I was always very interested in politics. I still am. And in those days, I was just, uh, you know, anxious to, and I, 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 I did some volunteer work for, I can't, I'm from Massachusetts, and I did some volunteer work for congressmen and senators from Massachusetts, uh, all of whom were pretty left-wing by, by uh, my, my standards. <laughs> uh, but I, I've, you know, I find it just very interesting. And um, so... Uh, I was working at uh, the time when Ron Paul was looking for a, a staff. I was working for um, a, a magazine in Oklahoma City called Private Practice, which was free market medical care. Uh, it was published by a uh, great doctor and up and passed on, uh, advocating that there should be no government intervention in the medical system whatsoever. Very unusual. Uh, he didn't let me write about why there shouldn't be 
why the, the, the doctors shouldn't be able to have licensing laws, although he agreed with that. But everything, <laughs> in every other way, the magazine stood for the, the total free market. Uh, but I, when, when I, re- I had met Ron Paul a couple of years before this all happened, and uh, of course, I'd, I'd just become his tremendous admirer. And uh, I thought about applying to him, and I was talking to Leonard Reed, who was the head of the Foundation for Economic Education, a great friend and a benefactor of mine. And he said, uh, he said, well, why don't you apply to Ron? And I said, well, I, sh- I said, I'm sure he's got, you know, hundreds of people trying to apply for these positions. And he says, let me, he said, let me uh, write Ron Paul on your behalf. So I thought, well, that, you know, t- t- tremendous. So Ron later said that that was what made up his mind, that uh, Leonard Reed had, had uh, written that I should, that he would be, have a good, a good staffer if he, uh, if he hired me as his chief of staff. So it was, you know, it was, and it always felt odd to be uh, working for the government. <laughs> and I, I always had trouble with it. The government check. I mean, it just in those days it was a, pr- a printed check. I had uh, went through a, a, a computer. It was an old-fashioned kind of uh, c- computerized check, and but it, uh, I must say, it always bothered me. But to work for Ron Paul was just, you know, he he's what a great man. I mean, he really is exactly what you you think he is. He worked very hard, very principled. Never backed down. Didn't matter who was bugging him to uh, to give up or to give in. He he wouldn't do it. And I can remember one night, and this was not atypical. Uh, we were in the office late, and because we'd been told that Ronald Reagan was going to call in President Reagan. So sure enough, he called, and I I put the call through to to uh, Dr. Paul, and I heard him talking, and um, he was. He was very polite. I only heard one one uh, end of the conversation, but Reagan was wanted his vote for some gigantic new uh, evil bomber, <laughs> the B one or the B twelve or the B eighty nine or whatever the heck it was. Some just it's a horrible thing. And of course, Rumpel was always uh, anti war and pro peace, and but but also he thought this thing was an unbelievable uh, example of spendthriftism. And here was Reagan, who was allegedly a conservative and wanting to cut the budget calling him to advocate the budget be massively expanded for this this evil bummer. And, of course, he wouldn't do it. And I remember thinking that, uh, watching Ron from the other office, that he he didn't, his arm was untwistable. <laughs> well, they always talk on Capitol Hill about whether to twist somebody's arm to get him to do something. He couldn't twist his arm. I mean, he wouldn't, he was polite. He was obviously respectful to the president. and uh, But he, he, he wouldn't do it. And uh, there was another case uh, later on when Newt Gingrich was the speaker. And uh, this was the first um, Republican budget that was going to have a uh, deficit. And so he, he said, he said, you know, uh, anybody who doesn't vote for this is going to be in trouble with me. They're going to be in trouble with the president. And uh, you, you must vote for this. And uh, he threatened all kinds of mayhem on people if they didn't vote and then he looked over at Ron and he said, except Ron Paul. Because <laughs> he knew he couldn't, he couldn't do it. He couldn't actually yeah. make Ron vote for a deficit budget. So that was, you know, was, what an honor to, to be able to work for him. And he, when I started the Institute, uh, he was a big help. Uh, he, he signed a, a fundraising letter to his own emailing list, which was pretty much unheard of. And uh, that was really how we got started financially. So... And he's always been a supporter of the Institute. Of course, he's thoroughly read in Austrian economics. And he started reading Austrian economics in the late 1960s when he was in in medical school. And um, he's read everything. He's an example of what reading everything, the kind of person it can make you into. Of course, you have to have a great IQ, too. (laughs) But he's just as uh, a tremendous man. I'm I'm so honored to know him and to... um, be his friend over all these years. He really is, he couldn't be a better exemplar of, of Austrian economics, of libertarianism. And I think that uh, it's all you need to know about certain people in the Libertarian Party. They don't like Ron Paul. Yeah. I mean, how can you not like Ron Paul? I mean, it's, it's. Uh, uh, but they're, they're, I'm sorry to say, you know, they're bad people. Yeah, he's always been the litmus test uh, for me. No question. 
Lou, thank you so much for doing this. I'm honored to get some of your time. Uh, before we go, in closing, can you tell my listeners about uh, LRC, anything you got coming up there, and Mises, where they can find you online? Well, they can yes, look at uh, lewrockwell.com, L-E-W-Rockwell.com. It's uh, a daily newsletter, actually six days a week, libertarianism, politics, wh- whatever I think, whatever I find interesting. Uh, did Jeffrey Epstein really commit suicide? I mean, all, the, all those kinds of <laughs> things as well. It's free. Uh, you're more than welcome to just c- come on and, and look at look at it, read it. Uh, LouRockwell.com. It's, you know, I appreciate donations too, but you don't have to be a donor. You could just be a reader, and I appreciate all my readers. And um, I think and hope you'll find it interesting. If you don't find it interesting, write me. Uh, if you do, and maybe you'd like to make a small donation, that's great too. But um, obviously, you should read Mises.org every day. It's uh, it's a tremendous website. It's the Freedom website, and uh, so there's just between those two sites, that's uh, plenty to read. But there are a lot of books you need to read too. And in fact, if anybody wants to drop me a note, uh, I'm glad to give them suggestions about, for example, what Mises books to read first, what Rothbard books to read first, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Maybe I can drop you a note. And if you give me that list, I'll link to it for this episode. That would be sure. Uh, that would be awesome. Lou Rockwell, thank you so much for being here on Death to Tyrants. Buck, great to be with you. What an honor it was to have the great Lou Rockwell on the show. So like we discussed there briefly at the end, he sent me the list of his book recommendations, the Mises books and the Rothbard books. I will link to those in the show notes page, of course. But let me give them to you real quick. I'll read them out. So you might need to hit pause on the podcast and get ready to write these down. The Mises books, Planning for Freedom, The Causes of the Economic Crisis, Liberalism, and Liberty and Property. Oh, also the Anti-Capitalistic Mentality. As for Lou's recommendations on Rothbard books, here we go. What has government done to our money? Anatomy of the State. The Case Against the Fed, For a New Liberty, and Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature. All of those are worth reading, I can assure you. I will link to them in the show notes page, as I will Lou's new book, and that one I mentioned early, The Left, the Right, and the State. I cannot recommend Lou's books highly enough. So, well, where does that leave us? It leaves us at, uh, you already know where to find me, Facebook.com slash Death to Tyrants podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B U C K R E B E L. Contribute to the show if you'd like. Patreon.com slash Death to Tyrants. And gosh, where do we go from here? I've had Lou Rockwell on the damn show. Does it get any better? I don't know. However, you can find out yourself next week. Have a great one. I'll see y'all later. But I am the center inside the placenta of math You clash with cyanide gas and die fast Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus Upon papyrus, I kill snipers and binding vipers And strangle you with the organs of writers who try to fight us Call me your highness and sip the blood